Yes. Okay, yeah. So uh, at Canlox, we love Ruby. So we are built on Ruby on Rails. Yeah. So I thought to share my journey and reflections. So if it can help in any way for you to build your own company or product in the future. Yeah. So for those that don't know about Talonox, uh, we build HR software for SMEs, just focusing on payroll and leave. All right. Um, so uh, we just have a, f- a few different modules. So profiles where you can store the employee information and to onboard your entire company in a breeze. Yeah. So Users usually use our import function, which will give them a Google Sheet so that they can key in the data on their own. So we don't need to handhold them. Uh, for payroll, we are localized for all the countries that we are in. Currently, it's uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. So if a company or HR admin were to run payroll for the countries that we're in, uh, the, everything will be the same and it's seamless so that uh, it's easy for them and they know what to expect. Uh, for leave, we will also take care of the statutory requirements that for the country they were in. Yep, so they, we, all the preset statutory requirements will be in the system. So they don't really have to worry about what's the default for every country. So yeah, and we are integrated uh, with uh, many banks and apps like Zero for accounting, uh, local banks, the DBS, OCBC, and UOB. But integration, I would say in this case today, is still a file generated at, Tel- at Telenox and the users will have to upload onto the bank portal. Uh, but yeah, we are slowly working with the banks to change this future and, and it will come soon. Something exciting will come soon. Yep, so we, are, we have an integrated ecosystem in Singapore uh, with, with CPF, IRS, uh, local banks, accounting and scheduling and time tracking. Uh, for Sing- we have a we have freemium basically. So we have a free plan and a paid plan. So we have a lot more companies on the paid plan actually. So, uh, so we can actually support SME of uh, many, many sizes. Uh, yeah, so I just thought to share with you all, like, uh, this, this, this is just an overview of what is Talonox, uh, in case uh, you all don't know. Yeah, so I thought to share, like, uh, how Talonox started, actually. Uh, that. Yeah, so uh, Gordon actually had a HR outsourcing background, while I'm a software engineer. So we met when Gordon was actually working on his uh, previous educational technology startup. And so I caught up with Gordon, uh, as a friend of mine, actually running an MNC in Qatar. Uh, had an issue finding a good HR system. So both of us then realized that uh, no one is really doing a good job uh, for HR software in Southeast Asia. So from this uh, reference uh, MNC customer, yeah, we really underestimated the amount of effort needed to build um, a HR software actually. So in end 2014, uh, we had to make a tough call to actually disappoint our first MNC customer uh, that actually believe in us. Uh, so while looking to actually support more SMEs in Singapore and around the region and understand their requirements. Yeah. So uh, at that time, it was quite tough uh, because uh, since it was a personal friend of mine. So in, but in 2015, uh, so, uh, so we started, we actually had uh, traction of 100, 200 SMEs really. So we started uh, like raising uh, angel, angel investments over three years. Uh, so in total, we raised about a million uh, by, by 2017. Yeah, and then we decided to go Hong Kong uh, and Malaysia. And then uh, today, we have about 3,000 SMEs uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. Yeah. Um, so I thought to talk about my journey so that it can help um, uh, or maybe uh, give you uh, some ideas on how everything was put together that, and it can maybe help you in your journey. So uh, surprising to many, actually, I chose the path of entrepreneurship, not because I really wanted to have a company, but more that I would want to work with good or great people uh, while painting the shared canvas of uh, a team of Telenox together. So on the top left is actually our first team retreat in Johor. It was about 2016. Yeah, so it was a small, small team, eight of us only. And uh, in 2018, also not too long ago, if you see at the bottom left, uh, actually the, the team only has about four engineers and it's four of us. <laughs> yeah, like uh, we're celebrating sounds with it. Yeah. And today uh, at the right-hand side, like we... We have a Zoom to celebrate this birthday. We have a team of 20 and we have about 10 engineers today. Uh, and uh, many of them are better than me in different skills. Like David would be good, very good in ops and, and Anunus, Danny. Yeah, many of the engineers are much better than me in many other skills. Uh, so I, I'm proud to build the team together with them. So uh, working on Talonox, uh, truthfully, if you were to meet me in person or to ask me, uh, I will admit to you that I really do not have passion for HR. 
Yeah, and uh, it, it's quite difficult to have passion for HR. <laughs> but I do have the passion to help others. Uh, and together with the team, actually, we put in a lot of effort to help others. Um, it's through directing this passion that I realized that, uh, that imagination is actually more important than knowledge. So because I came in without actually knowing anything about the industry, so I realized, and after some time, I realized why actually no one can actually also create a great experience for HR. So today we just have so much, still have so much to do. But yeah, so if you want to set out to do anything, yeah, even if you do not know anything about the thing you want to build, uh, if you can imagine how it can be better, just have the courage to go explore and make many mistakes. Yeah, I believe it will go somewhere. Okay, yeah. So yeah, the reason why I'm sharing a lot of my personal journey is also because um, it's really quite difficult to gain empathy and really keep it going for a long time. So because uh, it's actually a lot easier to enjoy and go build something for yourself but rather than for others. Uh. So if you personally want something, yeah, then um, go do it and try because uh, it's really much harder if you want to try to build something for others. Uh. You have to spend a lot of time to or empathy to actually go and do it. Yeah. So if you want to build something, you spend time to deeply think like what really drives you and uh, whether it's for yourself or others and what are the problems you really, really like to solve. Uh, will your end goal be a company or product where you actually can maintain as an indie or, indie or solo developer uh, while having a full-time job? There's no right or wrong answer. But most important is to find the fulfillment in what you like to do as an engineer. Yeah. So whether your angle is a company or indie developer, I thought it would be interesting to share like uh, finding a co-founder or people that are better than you. Yeah. So uh, God and I are beside each other in, in the photo on the left. Like, so I'm in black and he's the one on my right. Yeah. So um, I think peop- a lot of people talk about finding a co-founder. Yeah. But I think uh, what's most important is not skills over that, but, uh, but certain values that you have, especially when it comes to uh, money and integrity. Yep. So if you want to talk, if you want to build anything long-term, yep, so then those two values are paramount uh, because uh, both of us are actually thrifty in our own ways. And we have always prioritized like uh, valuing or paying and promoting the team members first rather than ourselves even during cash flow difficulties now. So which led us to always uh, find people better than ourselves as we want to take care of them and their needs and while challenging each other to go further. Uh, so your team work will actually get better and easier. Yeah. And uh, on, a, on a right, actually, like times like the pa- engineers are even more passionate than me. This is when we were beginning in t- 2016. This is actually in the toilet. So they are actually debugging or fixing the bug. Yeah, so... So engineers are even more passionate than me, you know, when, when there are certain problems, <laughs> they just had to do it in the toilet <laughs> of all places. Lah. So finding people better than you and uh, building to admit and learn from them is quite important. Yeah. So whether when you build a company or a product uh, as an indie, so you always need help in like marketing, sales, design, and all the other skills that are not uh, really engineering. So you or your team will actually uh, be also a lot more motivated when you actually have smart people around you to help you. So yeah, I can say that today our engineering team is better than me in many different ways and we're always hiring and looking out for engineers. Yeah. So uh, one way to actually find people better than you is also to learn to be better and also use your skills to actually help others as well. So in our early days, actually, we don't really have much to offer. Uh, so for Tanox, about half the team, I knew uh, a lot of them personally. So on the left is like the early beginnings of the company. You know. um, we already knew that I knew them from my personal endeavors, like assisting them in the past or already worked, worked with them before. So we did not have the finances to actually recruit them. Uh, but the initial team was motivated by everything else we had to offer but money, you know. So our friends also actually help us to build things before they left for their jobs or help us to recruit others. Like, so like on the right, the calculator I'm showing actually was built by a good friend of mine before he left for the US to join a startup and then Google. So due to today, like even till today, I knew like 
uh, half the team uh, personally uh, in engineering and business before they actually joined the company. Uh. Yeah. So uh, to end off, I thought that uh, it's important to find a problem or issue you really care about a lot and so that you can build something people want. Uh, and you're not likely to succeed on your first try. But the best way to learn is by building. Uh, yeah. So uh, imagination is uh, more important than knowledge. Yeah. And yeah, if I could do it coming into the industry without knowing much about HR, but yet uh, learn a lot about it. So I believe that uh, if, you're, if you really care about something, imagining it, how it can be better will really help you a lot. And uh, so, and find good or great people that you really want to work with from day one. So you need to look inward a lot also to be a good or great person to attract others to work with. Yeah. So building a Tenox actually made me a better person in many ways. Yeah. So that I can lead the company better too. And uh, yeah, so Tenox aspires to contribute one day back to Ruby, uh, like how Basecamp, GitHub, Shopify does it. And it's only when we do, then we're truly proud to consider ourselves a tech company. Uh. Yeah, I think that's all for my sharing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that was a great, great sharing. Um, now I guess now it's just like the the Q and A. So, um, anybody have any questions? Uh, just feel free to shout out if you are very shy about asking it, like on on record. You can type it down. I, I can ask it ask it for you. Uh, yeah, maybe I can start off like um yeah, I understand. I, I know like like you said, um Talonox uses Ruby, right? <laughs> I, I mean this is a Ruby meta, so like, my question is like why 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 do you guys like stick to Ruby? Do do we, do y'all like run into um what other people call like performance issues and stuff like that. And if you do that, how, how do you, how do you all like get over it? Um, I think recently we are facing like memory issues. Yeah. So David and I, we were looking into it uh, because once the app grows bigger and once we had to load a lot of objects, like for the employees and for many large companies, we can see the memory profile has always been increasing larger and larger. So it's a challenge to manage uh, that's why we have been looking into those issues and uh, what really helped was also using jmalloc that it really showed a 20 percent drop in the memory usage huh? yeah so that really helped a lot performance wise uh, it's it actually works for us though yeah but the memory issue is really a challenge yeah. why, why do you guys like like uh like what why, why will you like Okay, probably I'm not like discouraging you. I'm just like curious, like maybe do you all have any decision like why you want to stick with Ruby or uh or is like because you guys like the real framework, etc. Um I don't know what's the opinion for all the other engineers, but personally uh I really enjoy reading Ruby Cola. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's a very personal thing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, very, very personal, yeah. Mm, so nice. I think that really helps, yeah. Okay, Edwin, thank you. My name is Ernest. Uh, Hi, so Ernest. I want to <clears throat> find out, so I guess it's, it's a monolith, right? And if it is, then how do new uh, new developers who come on board get acquainted with the code? And if it is microservice, are you still using Ruby or you are using another language or it's just pure Ruby? Oh yeah, we are using a, a monolith. Yeah, so uh, all the code is together in the same code base. Uh, so in Tenox, everyone is divided into uh, different teams or squads like Shopify. So they all work on different parts of the code base. So the leads will actually onboard them uh, with their own like uh, documentation or knowledge uh, on how the code base works and to help them figure out the initial the initial, initial how the code will will work uh, like for leave or payroll. Yeah, the ops team, which uh, David is in, is the most challenging because they work across the entire code base to help with any performance issues uh, that they face. Yeah. And the front end, is it, do you do any kind of maybe JavaScript or any of the uh, uh, JavaScript web frameworks or libraries like React or Vue.js or just pure vanilla JavaScript? Oh. 
yeah, we are using uh, Angular currently. Uh, mm -hmm. However, we are considering to, we are actually exploring different ways now to what's the best direction to move towards, uh, whether to use a React or, or Stimulus or with Hotwire that what uh, Hey and Basecamp they are doing. So we're actually exploring the next direction uh, and hope to make a decision soon. Uh. Mm -hmm. Last last question. Sorry, I'm no I'm no problem. Here. So so I mean, it started with a version of Rails, right? So over the years, you have to keep on upgrading depending on the version that is coming. So uh, the current version, I assume, is either five or six, and now seven is coming along. So how is that? Do you have difficulty importing, especially with the changes that are involved in seven now? Almost everyone is going nuts. <laughs> I mean, it has divided the group into two. So I'm just how do you, do you do you find difficulty in change in upgrading, let's say from five to six, then from six to seven, which is coming? Um, it's a good question. Uh, actually, uh, we have an engineer called Ananos. His name is Ananos. Uh, yeah. So he actually always helps. We started from four and when Tanlock started. Um, so over the years, he actually has always uh, helped us to see how we can start moving the upgrade path towards five six and we are preparing to go to seven uh, so we are 6.0 going to 6.1 to then uh, then to seven directly yeah so, so you, you need someone to work on it yeah okay. Really. Okay. Yeah. okay so there's someone dedicated in ensuring the upgrade hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah he has the passion to like look forward to be more of like future thinking for us yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's quite nice yeah oh, okay. thank you for the questions thank you all right i'll go next uh, hi, I'm Ted. Hi, uh, so, so it sounds like uh, some of the killer features uh, of the product is uh, that you're able to integrate uh, with like IRAS and other uh, systems that uh, the HR staff need to uh, interface any with anyway. So, how did you go about that? Did you just uh, like take the bus down to IRAS? <laughs> office and ask like hey do you have an api or something <laughs> <laughs> thank you for asking uh, um actually when iras uh, wanted to build the api they asked us for their feedback uh, the reason is also because we were also we also had a lot of smes compared to other companies uh, in our space so they wanted to know whether things could work out and how would the initial impl implementation be you know? Because I, we gave them the feedback that before the API, let's say if you're a HR admin, uh, you will probably need to take like two hours just to submit your text. It's quite crazy actually. Yeah, so because you have to figure out, you got to go through a 50 page document to learn how to submit it. I, I have to go through that. So I, I know how it feels. Yeah, so we actually asked uh, ask them when, when they're doing it and actually they happen to be doing it. Yeah, so, and we actually had to explore. So, they're quite forward thinking, actually. I think also because IRAS is the revenue generation of the country. So <laughs> they do have a lot more resources to innovate and move, move quite fast. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So the timing just works out for a second. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. No problem. So about so about follow-up to Ted question. So it means so how do they so um is every company that you are integrated with, are they uploading the content themselves if they are uploading onto your platform or all of them have an API? And if they all have an API, how are you consolidating all the endpoints into one to ensure a seamless integration? And secondly, how are they doing the upload? Do they have a spreadsheet with a, a well-defined data set to upload? Um, yeah, like for IRAS, I would say that there is a well-defined API on what you want to submit. Yeah, because for taxation, the fields are quite fixed about the information that they want. Yeah. And uh, not all the time you have a very well-defined API, for, but for the government, yeah, you, they're actually working quite a lot on it. And there's a lot of very good improvements uh, for the APIs, especially coming from IRS. But for the banks, uh, it's still a little bit far behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, Erin, uh, Adrian. Um, yeah, I'm from. So I, I also co-founder uh, Node So I, I think, I think the question that I have is that I, I, I see that you, you didn't have much experience like when you started telling knots, right? So like I was like, well, what, what, what is the like the one of the few like challenge you face as a relatively inexperienced like um like CTO when you started? Hmm. 
I think the hardest is always uh, recruiting other engineers, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's the hardest. Um, I think technically, I feel that I could always figure out. Uh, the, the hard part is always uh, finding like, like-minded and good people to work together, actually. Yeah, I guess that was always the, the constant challenge, the people, the people portion of building a team and a company. Yeah. But but then uh like because I think I think I from a very similar like background with from you lah. So like mm. yeah, what 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 would you advise to, like for for someone that like also have like not much technical experience when it comes to like um hiring the the first few engineers? Um, I I think find people. So how I did. It, the how the way maybe I talk about the way we interview people. It's quite different from most companies. It's a bit maybe it's a bit similar to what Basecamp is doing also, but it's a bit different also. So we actually I send them a list of questions and uh, this list of questions depending on how they answer. Like I'll just ask them what's their dream or what's their hardest uh, challenge they face in life. What's the most difficult technical challenge? Um, the reason why I ask ask all these questions first when well, when I filter them for the first session of the course, uh, we are a remote team actually. So since we are a remote team, they need to know how to communicate their ideas uh, through text uh, or else it will be very hard to work with others. I Some of my engineers, I never see them for a few years really. So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, like I rarely meet many of them in person actually. Sometimes it's quite nice to really meet them in person. So that's why we want to filter this way. Then from there, I read their responses to tell uh, maybe how they can how they think yeah so it's quite internal reflecting based on our culture then that's our first stage uh. so second stage interview we actually like well if they have ruby and Rails experience we'll pay them to work with us and the reason why we do that is because also uh, maybe we pay them to work on a feature together then we can tell how they work yeah so uh, we are not at the type where we want to do programming tests and stuff like that because uh, a few doesn't find the engineers that we can work with the best. Yeah, we like to work with people first. Like, uh, like some of the senior engineers also, we work with them for a few years actually before, before they join us or so. Yeah, so we we really like that. And the final stage would be just to see like, um, like for them to meet the different leaders and people so that we can see if the character fits. Now. So um, I, I wouldn't really say advice maybe from a, uh, from the same experience and and from a friend to friend, uh, maybe um, this uh, you don't don't need to be afraid. It's actually an honor to hire people that are better than you technically. Uh, the good thing, the most important thing is to find, to reflect on what really works well for you and what kind of people you enjoy working with. Then create the process to help you find those people. Mm. Uh, then then it can kind of work out. Like yeah. Like so, if you like, if you feel like algorithm problems, then maybe you need to find <laughs> people that, <laughs> that really likes that lot. Yeah, that, that's really nothing wrong. I mean, that's how like Google started out too, right? And uh, it, it works for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just find something that really works well for you personally. Yeah. And I think uh, you will attract the people that you will really like to work with. Uh, yeah. This question will be quite biased because I'm. Um, I'm looking for entry level. So um, what trainings like do you have for maybe for, do you have entry level position for junior developers? And that, uh, how is the training like? What do you expect of them? What, what do you expect someone to have as a junior developer for you to consider even bringing them on board to work with you for that period of time whilst you are assessing them? Yeah, for juniors, we actually look at the type of, problems they have solved before and what type of projects they worked on or what are the things that they built before. Those are actually quite good signs. Uh, um, because uh, like or whether we are they are willing to pick up uh, Ruby on Rails. Yeah. So we actually put actually all our interns we put them through learning Ruby on Rails using the Rails tutorial. Because uh, if you if you don't want to pick it up then it's it's for us, I think, uh, I mean, maybe for me personally, like being an engineer means you have to learn many things, mm-hmm. but if you're not willing to learn the stack that the company works on, then it's a bit difficult for us to also work with you. Yeah. So so we kind of like, 
want them to learn. Uh. We know that it's not what we put them is not easy. It's going to be long. It's going to be a commitment. Yep. So we put them, we put them through it uh, so that if they commit themselves to learning, actually every intern or every junior will have a mentor so that they can actually learn learn from this person. Uh. Yeah. So that's how we create a good uh, learning structure. There's still a lot that we have to do, like maybe uh, like good learnings from the different senior engineers as well as we learn. Yeah, but it's always a work in progress for us like, to, for both the senior engineers to learn and we can teach juniors better. So, yeah. So what how about with regards to gems, right? Do you uh, gemify everything or uh, the, uh, the pro- you look at the trade-offs of, using which gem is going to solve your problem or which one you or team have to handcraft? Uh, how is the balance like? Um, I mean, we, we are quite pragmatic. Uh, it's a good question to figure out things, um, but we are quite pragmatic. If the gem works, then we will, we will use it um, or else we will also explore deeply how to solve it. Because sometimes there are some problems with a gem that suddenly has a CVE issue and you, we cannot deploy because we'll have a our bundle of data will throw errors and you know it will hot everyone up. So uh, we 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 do need to make decisions like that on quite a daily basis. But the engineers actually go ahead on what's most pragmatic while also keeping like all the baseline practices like, like passing the bundle of data, passing all tests and things for things to go live. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Mm. I actually have one question. Mm. Uh, you, you said that you, you guys are full remote, right? And are the engineers uh, do you hire from the region or is it just Singapore? Uh, we are hi- trying to hire from all over the region actually. Yeah. So mm. and yeah, like, like of course like I I we I, I run the Ruby SG community, so I'm actually like curious um how are the Ruby engineers like out, outside of Singapore. Um, so far, we have uh, three engineers working from Malaysia. Actually, we are trying to find hire outside more. Uh, yeah, but uh, three, three, three in Malaysia, and the rest are in Singapore. Yeah, mm-hmm. Seven of them in Singapore. Yeah. So uh, we actually, I think they didn't had Ruby background at first, but, but mm-hmm. only when they joined Tenlox, they started out the experience. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. I, I think one question, right? Like, um, like looking back, right? Like, what what are some like maybe some technical decisions that you wouldn't have like, um, you wouldn't have do it that you 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 do things otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a good question. I have to think. Um. Technically, actually, uh, Rails really helped us a lot, uh, to be honest. Um, but maybe, uh, I think the hardest is knowing what not to do. Uh. Maybe the challenge technically hasn't, we hasn't reached a large bottleneck yet because every time we reach a certain challenge, um, there's always a good practice in how to solve it. Like, for example, if the, the load gets too high, or what, what can we do? And we always have good people to help us, uh, like... Uh, um, for example, when we face a scaling issue, when there were too many re- requests and how can we do it? Or like actually David also was helping us to switch to Kubernetes so that we can start to scale and we can start to scale our nodes temporarily. So everyone worked together to solve these issues. Um, so I can't really think of an issue where I think I would do things differently, but definitely uh, no cutting down on a lot more stuff that doesn't need to be done, uh, like for features wise, will really help us a lot. Uh. Yeah. So the good thing about Telenox, I guess, is that we make a lot of decision based on how we can improve the user's experience. Uh. So we don't have to, uh, I would say, chase features so that you can get customers, Yeah, which is always quite a dangerous path uh, to go into. Yeah, yeah, because once you go into that path, you can't remove features easily. So, I guess, yeah, for me, it's more, I think, I think we, I've been quite blessed to have, like, good people uh, that we all solve all these problems together, actually. 
but maybe we would not do Angular so early, maybe, which will help the development path faster. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. I have one question about, uh, like, maybe like just deployment and like how you all do your infrastructure. Like, do, do you guys started out with, with like Heroku or you do your own servers configuration, all those stuff? Yeah. We started with Heroku. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> until, we can, until we cannot take it anymore because uh, the memory bloat is there's memory bloat keeps blowing up so you have to increase the dyno memory so we moved out to aws and uh, we set up with capistrano yeah, I remember. and uh yeah then with capistrano then there are some issues also uh, like uh, because you had to manually image the images and do the deployments for us when scaling you get old code yeah, so uh, after for one or two years with capistrano then uh, because the issues aren't easy to solve as you go uh, so we decided to move uh, everything over to Kubernetes when it came out. Yeah, and it was a nightmare when we first started, actually, uh, because um, there were some issues with AWS uh, when we hosted Kubernetes masters on it. I think uh, <laughs> David knew when we were. So every time David goes to Genting, our system goes down. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so for the first time he goes to Genting, the system went down. <laughs> so I was like 10, 10 p.m. calling him. He was <laughs> in the hotel room. Then I was at night trying to try to bring up the system. <laughs> yeah. Because I think there's some AWS bug also that is causing uh this AWS bug that they didn't want to talk about the way that how the networking works. It brought down all the masters. So all the nodes went down. Yeah. So we had to quickly try to bring up the cluster. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, David. You are damn awesome. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so actually David really really helped us a lot. Yeah, then uh, we we actually worked together a lot very, very closely uh, to, to bring out everything and uh, it was really quite a fun time uh, in the way. Yeah. Then Kubernetes actually was really awesome and a great decision. Um it really simplified our lives a lot and the scaling issues and uh, David can probably talk more next time or so uh, in another talk uh, like how it helped everyone. Yeah. Nice. And then, uh, like, how do y'all do? Do y'all do like pure CI CD, or y'all like do staging and like must then deploy to prod this kind? Yeah. Uh, we do like pure CI CD. Uh, it's just that deployments are not uh, automatic. Uh, so the engineers can decide when they want to deploy or uh, when they want to deploy actually, because sometimes there could be migrations uh, that might that might table log a lot, so they can actually be more alert when they do a deploy or so. Yeah. So you all will do a merge and then they will decide when to push it out. Correct, correct. Yeah, they will decide when to, they want to push it out. Because during certain periods, we can't deploy as easily like everyone. Like uh, there was once, I think we brought down the system during a payroll period. So then suddenly mm -hmm. you get, you will get like 10 mess, you get like 20 messages every minute. You know, like everybody's trying to use the system and the system's down. Yeah, so it's quite intense. Like, yeah. Um, interesting. Like, okay, I, I work in Shopify, so so we do like have crunch time around the year, uh, like crunch time specific months of the year. Like, is there such a thing for Talonox, or is it pretty like distributed? The the load. Um, the load is quite distributed in some way. I think, uh, depending on uh, what. Of what we are going through like currently we are going through security audit so the ops team will be more busy like the david's team will be more busy um the payroll team is usually a lot busier maybe in in the early 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 start of the year like january and february because that's the tax season and it will be really busy so everyone is quite spread out so we try our best to spread out the load and preempt the preempt when peak period will happen yeah but for shopify they all have a peak period or yeah, we do. Our peak period is uh during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, mm. like that that full probably like plus minus total one month about there, of the year lah. Mm. Understandable, yeah. Understandable, yeah. Um. Anybody else have any more questions? Mm, okay, I guess not. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Edwin, like for answering all our questions and sharing with us like how, how Telenox was built and all the internals.